Over the past few millennia, humanity has gone through several major technology revolutions. Around 10,000 years ago, we entered the agricultural revolution. This revolution led to new technologies like farming, the plow, and the wheel. As a result, agricultural societies spread from the cradle of civilization to the ends of the earth. Around 250 years ago, we entered the industrial revolution. This revolution led to new technologies like steam power, the factory, and electricity. As a result, industrial societies flourished and spread throughout the globe. Less than 100 years ago, we entered the information revolution. This revolution led to new technologies like telecommunications, electronic computers, and digital information. As a result, high-tech societies flourished and spread throughout the globe and throughout cyberspace. With each of these revolutions, human society was radically transformed over a relatively short period of time. With each revolution, we saw a wellspring of new technologies that had never existed before. And with each revolution, there were those who prepared and thrived in this new world, and those who were unprepared and became redundant, unemployable, or obsolete. Today, we're entering the next major revolution in human history, the AI revolution. Like the previous tech revolutions, we'll likely see a fundamental transformation of our economy and our society. We'll likely see a wellspring of new AI-enabled technologies, and there'll be some people who will prepare and thrive in this new world, and others who will not be prepared, who will become redundant, unemployable, and obsolete. The purpose of this presentation is to answer the following question. What should I do today to prepare my career for the coming wave of AI-enabled automation? What should you be doing right now to prepare as we enter this next major technology revolution? However, I don't want to provide you with a bunch of pie-in-the-sky wishful thinking. I want to provide you with advice that's specific, actionable, pragmatic, and timely. Advice that you'll be able to put to use today to come out on top when all of the dust settles after the end of the AI revolution. To answer this question, I'll offer you the following five recommendations. Educate yourself about AI, upgrade your career for AI, invest in an AI-first economy, use AI responsibly and ethically, and adapt to what comes next or become obsolete. With each of these recommendations, we're going to go a bit wider in scope and also in time scale. But unfortunately, we just have a half hour session today rather than a full hour session. So I'm going to have to skip the last two recommendations to stay within our time limit. However, if you're interested in learning more at the end of this presentation, I'll show you where to go to watch a video of the presentation I gave just last week where I answered the final two questions. But first, before we get into the practical advice, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page about what artificial intelligence is and what it isn't. So what is AI? Artificial intelligence is a field of computer science that attempts to create machines that act rationally in response to their environment. An AI is any machine that perceives its environment and chooses actions that maximize the likelihood of achieving a goal of some kind. Essentially, it's just a machine that takes data as input and produces the best output that it knows or given what it currently knows. Some examples of AI include computers that can play chess, Google's predictive search algorithm, non-player characters in video games, and the navigation software on your smartphone. Any computer algorithm that replicates some aspect of human intelligence is essentially a form of artificial intelligence. Now, when I say artificial intelligence, many of you will immediately think of sentient robots like R2-D2, data from Star Trek, and HAL 9000. This is what we refer to as artificial general intelligence or general AI. General AI can solve a wide variety of general purpose problems. It's a type of futuristic AI that doesn't currently exist today. In fact, it'll likely be several decades before we reach this level of highly flexible, generalizable, and adaptable AI. However, this is the direction that we're moving and the eventual goal of many AI research projects. On the other hand, many of you may think of modern AI like IBM's Watson, Amazon Alexa, or Google's self-driving car. This is what we call artificial narrow intelligence or narrow AI. Narrow AI is focused on solving a very narrow set of specific problems. It's the type of AI that exists today, the type of AI that we're gonna be talking about during this presentation. However, it's also the type of AI that will likely revolutionize our world over the next few decades. Now, it might surprise some of you to know that artificial intelligence has been around for quite some time. In fact, the field of AI dates all the way back to the 1950s. In the past, we had some machines that were capable of making rational decisions. However, they had to be explicitly programmed to make these decisions, and they could only operate successfully in very constrained environments. There was a lot of hype about what artificial intelligence would eventually be able to do. 
Many experts predicted that machines would soon replace humans in pretty much all types of labor, but it never happened. And by the end of the 1990s, machines couldn't even solve basic general purpose tasks that even a toddler could solve. The inflated hype about the potential of artificial intelligence and subsequent disillusionment when none of this ever happened led to what we now refer to as the AI winter or AI winters. Uh, multiple periods between the late 70s into the early 2000s where funding for artificial intelligence had almost entirely dried up. However, by the mid 2000s, the last AI winter has ended and things are starting to warm up again. Today in 2020, AI is booming because of recent advances in machine learning, deep learning, and reinforcement learning. If this trend continues into the near future, AI will likely become even more lucrative as it begins to disrupt, disrupt almost every industry imaginable. So hopefully now we're all on the same page about what artificial intelligence is and what it isn't. It's an, an AI is essentially a machine that can act rationally in response to its environment. We're talking specifically about about artificial narrow intelligence or narrow AI, which can solve a very limited set of problems. And it's an industry that's been through various cycles of booms and busts, largely based on the ratio of hype versus real world applications. So step one, educate yourself about AI. Why is education important during a technology revolution? Why can't we just continue to go about our day-to-day -day lives as the world changes around us? With each of the previous technology revolutions, there was a need to update human education to function in the new world. With the agricultural revolution, humans had to become, become proficient with agricultural technologies. As a result, we had to learn how to farm, domesticate animals, and how to use a plow. With the industrial revolution, human had, humans had to become proficient with industrial technologies. As a result, we had to learn how to operate steam engines, run machinery, and use electricity. And with the information revolution, humans had to become proficient with information technologies. As a result, we had to learn how to use telephones, work with computers, and program software. With the AI revolution, humanity will once again need to update its basic skill set to become AI literate. We'll need to learn how to train AI models, develop AI applications, and use AI tools. So whether you realize it or not, our world is going through a major transition as we speak. We're entering the era of artificial intelligence and machine learning, a future where machines will be doing many of the jobs that humans are currently doing today. As a result, the software industry is preparing to go through a major transition as well. In the past, we would have to explicitly program a computer step-by-step -step to solve a problem. This involved a lot of if-then statements, for loops, and logical operations. So um, today, however, uh, machines can teach themselves how to solve problems on their own, and we just need to provide the data. And now this is a radically different way of working with a computer than we're used to as software developers and IT professionals. While there's a growing demand for individuals with the skills necessary to implement AI uh, solutions, there's currently a shortage of people capable of teaching machines how to solve these problems in this new way. As a result, those with the skills necessary to leverage AI are commanding significantly higher salaries. And this trend doesn't seem to have any end in sight. Now, think back to our last major technology revolution, the information revolution. Each of us had a choice to either learn how to use a computer or to stay computer illiterate. And now think of all the opportunities that computer literacy has afforded you over the years, and think of all the disadvantages for those who can barely use a computer. The same will be true for AI literacy during the AI revolution. Those that are AI literate will be highly functional in our new economy, and those who are not will sit on the sidelines and eventually become obsolete. So how should you educate yourself about AI? What is the right way to teach yourself about this new set of technologies? First, learn the basics of AI. Learn the difference between what is real versus what is hype. Learn about data science, machine learning, deep learning, and reinforcement learning. And learn the difference between artificial narrow intelligence and artificial general intelligence. Learn how to identify which is which. Everyone in our general public needs to have a basic level of AI literacy in order to function in our new AI-driven society. Second, choose your objective with AI. What do you actually want to do or accomplish with artificial intelligence? Do you want to train new AI models using existing machine learning algorithms to automate tasks that have yet to be automated? Do you want to develop develop new AI applications using pre-trained AI models to solve problems that have yet to be solved. 
Or do you just want to augment your human skills to become more efficient using pre-built AI tools? You need to decide what you want to do with AI before you can decide which skills you'll actually need. Third, get the right training. For each of these three objectives that we just discussed, there's an ideal learning path or curriculum. For AI trainers, you'll need training in both data science and machine learning. For AI developers, you'll need uh, programming skills and the ability to work with pre-trained AI models. For AI tool users, you'll just need basic AI literacy and tra training on each specific AI tool as necessary. What's important is that you get the right training necessary for each chosen objective. Fourth, you need to practice your skills. No matter which training you choose, you're gonna need lots of practice. It's one thing to know what a neural network is. However, it's a very different thing to be able to train a neural network to detect fraud. You can participate in online competitions like Kaggle competitions to apply your skills while learning with your peers. You can create and maintain open source projects to share your knowledge with others while you learn. Or you can find low risk projects at work to practice your new skills and build up your portfolio. Ultimately, you need to find lots of opportunities to practice the new skills that you've learned. Finally, choose reliable sources of information. You want to avoid the AI hucksters, charlatans, and snake oil salesmen out there. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people out there using big hype and a lot of buzzwords to try taking advantage of you so that they can take your money. Instead, you want to find trusted sources for all of your information and training. So be sure to check out your source's credentials, qualifications, and experience. You wanna make sure that you're getting the most value for your investment in your AI education. So to recap our first recommendation, educate yourself on AI, learn the basics of AI, choose your objective with AI, get the right training, practice your skills, and choose reliable sources. All right, step two, upgrade your career for AI. Will AI take my job? This is the most common question I get asked when I tell people that I work with artificial intelligence. During each of the previous technology revolutions, we've seen fundamental shifts in employment. During the agricultural revolution, we saw the rise of the farmer and the decline of the hunter-gatherer. During the industrial revolution, we saw the rise of the factory worker and the decline of the artisan and craftsman. And during the information revolution, we saw the rise of the office worker and the decline of the manual laborer. During the AI revolution, we will likely see a similar shift in our careers within our labor economy. Now, imagine you could ask a horse in the early 1900s how the automobile or tractor would have changed its life. From the horse's perspective, it probably would have told you that a car or a tractor is going to make its life a lot easier. Things are going to be a lot better once we've got that car. Unfortunately for the horse, these technologies also made them obsolete to the economy. In fact, we hit peak horse right at 1915, just as the automobile and tractor began to scale up in production. Today, the emergence of modern AI is beginning to have a strong impact on our labor economy. In the near future, this impact on labor will likely be tremendous. AI will automate a significant number of jobs in the next few decades. Given the economics driving this trend, it's less a matter of if a given job will be replaced and more a matter of when. Some experts are currently attempting to predict which jobs will most likely or are most likely to be automated based on measures like their repetitiveness and complexity. In fact, we can even predict what type of AI technology will be necessary to automate a wide variety of occupational tasks. For example, we can see which retail jobs are likely to be automated in the coming years as AI continues to be applied to retail sales. Even the medical industry isn't immune to this coming wave of automation. While these medical tasks are generally more complex and less repetitive than most jobs, they're rapidly becoming within the reach of modern AI. We can then extrapolate this information to determine which sectors of our economy will be hit the hardest by AI automation. The length of the bars in this chart represent the total number of workers in each type of employment in the United States as of 2016. The red bar segments represent the proportion of jobs at risk of being automated in the next two decades. The blue bar segments represent the proportion of jobs that are not at risk of automation in the next two decades. As we can see, if these predictions are correct, the future landscape of labor in the next few decades is likely gonna look radically different than it does today. In fact, we can even use these data to predict which cities will be most impacted by unemployment from AI automation. As we can see, Las Vegas, Nevada, where Heather and I live, is currently at the top of the list. Oh, and where Rokas lives half of the time, too. 
In fact, it's predicted that 65% of all jobs in Las Vegas are at risk of automation by 2035. And half of all jobs in the United States of America are at risk of automation in the next two decades. Similar projections have been made about other countries throughout the world as well. Some are at more risk, some are less risk, but overall, a lot of automation. So there's certainly going to be many jobs that are more resistant to automation because these jobs require more human aspects like uh, compassion, creativity, empathy, and trust. But there are certainly going to be many jobs today that are unlikely to exist in the next few decades. And this is going to create a tremendous disruption to our labor economy with unemployment, retraining, and early retirement. On the other hand, it's going to create tremendous opportunities for new jobs that don't uh, yet exist and for the IT professionals that build these automation systems. That's all of us. The big question right now is whether AI will create more jobs than it eliminates. Historically, technology revolutions have created more new job opportunities than they've destroyed. However, there's pretty compelling evidence to suggest that the AI revolution may be different. We're beginning to transition from an economy where most of the work of value is done by humans to one where most of the work of real economic value will be done by machines. As a result, it's important to ask yourself, which side of this new economy will your job be on? The side that's leading the new economy or the side that's being eliminated? So how should we upgrade our career for AI? First, determine if your job is at risk of automation. Is your job simple, repetitive, dangerous, error prone, or expensive? If so, it's at a higher risk of being automated. Or is your job complex, creative, compassionate, or uniquely human? If so, it's at lower risk of being automated. However, it's important to note that most jobs will not be completely automated. Rather, they will be partially automated as many of the day-to-day -day tasks in each job become automatable with AI. As a result, it's likely that you'll spend most of your day in many jobs essentially just babysitting software or babysitting robots all day. Second, decide if your company is at risk of becoming obsolete within our AI-first economy. Are you still using traditional business tools while your competitors are automating with AI? Are you still relying on guesswork while others are using data to improve decision-making? Or are you in an industry that's currently being disrupted by new AI-enabled business models? If so, you either need to help your company embrace AI now, or you may want to start looking for an employer that's already moving in the right direction. It's quite likely that many employers will not survive the AI revolution, just like we saw in the previous technology revolutions. Third, you need to choose an AI career path. You need to decide how closely and how deeply you want to work with AI. If you want to train AI models or build AI models, you'll need to find a company with access to lots of data and compute power in order to be used for training these models. If you want to develop AI applications, you'll need to work for a tech company and use pre-trained AI models from third-party AI providers. If you want to just use AI tools to become more efficient as a, a worker, uh, you can work with anyone you choose, provided that they encourage the use of these new AI tools. Ultimately, you need to decide uh, what you want to do with AI before you can decide what your career path or best career path will be. Fourth, get into the AI value stream. You don't need to work at Google to make a good living in the new AI economy. However, you do want to be a part of the AI value stream uh, or the ecosystem that's built on top of AI technologies. This can involve working for tech companies and horizontal markets that are positioned well within the AI value stream. For example, companies working on the Internet of Things, big data, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality, robotics and drones. Or it can mean, uh, sorry, uh, that was uh, horizontal industries, or it can mean vertical industries built on top of AI technologies. Essentially, look for industries that generate lots of data to tr train AI models or use AI models to improve their existing products and services. Finally, focus on the uniquely human aspects of your job. Avoid specializing too deeply on tasks that can be easily automated. These include tasks that are simple, repetitious, or dangerous. Instead, specialize on the aspects of your job that cannot be easily automated. These include aspects like human interaction, creativity, compassion, and establishing trust. These are the tasks that will still remain when we've automated away all of the mundane tasks from our job. So to recap our second re recommendation, upgrade your career for AI, or uh, determine if your job is at risk of automation, decide if your company is at risk of becoming obsolete, choose an AI career path, get into the AI value stream, and focus on the human aspects of your job. All right, and for our third and final recommendation today, invest in an AI-first economy. 
who will be the world's first trillionaire? Who's going to win and who's going to lose in the new AI economy? During the agricultural revolution, we had visionary societies like the Sumerians, the Egyptians, and the Chinese. They all capitalized on the key technologies of the agricultural revolution. As a result, they became some of the largest civilizations on earth at the time. During the industrial revolution, we had visionaries like John D. Rockefeller, Thomas Edison, and Henry Ford. They all capitalized on the key technologies of the industrial era. As a result, they became some of the most influential and wealthiest industrialists on the planets. During the information revolution, we had visionary companies like IBM, Microsoft, and Google. They all capitalized on the key technologies of the information age. As a result, they became some of the most influential and wealthiest corporations on the planet. During the AI revolution, there will likely be future visionaries. They're also going to capitalize on these key AI technologies. As a result, they will likely become some of the most influential and wealthiest people on the planet. In fact, many experts predict that the world's first trillionaire will likely be created from wealth generated by an artificial intelligence. The AI revolution will likely have a significant impact on our economy and capitalism as we know it. These changes will require that individuals, businesses, and governments adapt to in order to function in this new AI-first economy. First, we're seeing a shift in returns to capital versus returns to labor. Returns to capital are essentially how much money you can make by investing in capital assets. These include investing in machines, software, data, and more. Returns to labor are essentially how much money you can make by soliciting your labor for income. These include uh, physical labor, knowledge work, and highly specialized labor. Over the past few decades, we've seen a continuous upward trend in returns to capital. As a result, the value that you can get from investing in capital assets continues to increase. On the other hand, we've seen a continuous decrease in returns to labor. As a result, the value that you can get from each hour of your labor is continuing to decrease. Essentially, labor is becoming cheap and automation is becoming highly profitable. This phenomenon is referred to as the great decoupling. Essentially, productivity in the United States and other parts of the world continued to rise year after year. However, somewhere around the 1970s, labor compensation broke away from this productivity gain trend. This diverging trend will likely continue into the future and become even further amplified, amplified with increasing AI automation. Second, data will likely become one of the most valuable resources in our information economy. Those that have the most data and the ability to enable AI with that data will wield tremendous power in the information economy. In fact, there are data sets that exist today that are currently valued at over a billion dollars. It's just ones and zeros sitting on a computer somewhere that are worth over a billion dollars. Third, the AI revolution will likely lead to a significantly more nonlinear economy. Those with smart machines will have even more power, and those without smart machines will unfortunately have even less power. It will become progressively harder for individuals in small businesses to compete with largest established tech companies unless we change regulations in how our economy works. So how do you invest in an AI first economy? First, invest in yourself. The best way to leverage your time, money, and resources is to invest in your education and your career first. We've covered a lot of this in the previous two recommendations. However, it's important enough to be stated again. The best investment you can make right now is an investment in yourself. Second, don't depend solely on your labor for income. Your labor is going to become progressively less value as valuable as we automate more jobs. This includes manual labor, knowledge work, and even highly specialized labor. Instead, you need to begin putting your money into wealth generating assets. These include investing in companies, selling your own products, and providing automated services. Your labor can only make you money while you're working. However, assets allow you to make money 24 hours a day, even while you're sleeping. Third, invest in the economy as a whole. The AI revolution is ultimately going to lift the entire economy. Anyone that survives the AI revolution will be benefited by these technologies. So you don't need to try to outsmart the markets. You just need to invest in the economy as a whole. My personal investment strategy is as followed, and I am not a financial advisor, so don't take this as financial advice. I'm simply just telling you what I do so that you can use this information to make your own decisions going forward. I diversify my investments to reduce my overall risk. I do this using index funds with very low expense ratios like Vanguard's total stock market index and their world stock index fund. Index funds spread your investments out across the entire stock market to minimize your overall risk. Essentially, the entire global economy would have to collapse irreparably in order for me to lose all of my investments. And if that happens, we've got a lot bigger problems. 
Um, I buy low and I hold all of my investments. I don't day trade, I don't speculate, I don't short sell, I don't try to time the market. Instead, I just invest regularly in my index fund. I put extra money in when the market's low and I keep all of my investments long-term and just rebalance once a year. And I have a safety net during economic downturns. I have just enough in the bond market and semi-liquid assets to cover me during a recession or like a COVID-19 pandemic if I need the money. Um, I progressively grow the size of the safety net as I get closer to retirement too, when you'll actually need it more likely when you don't have an uh, income. And uh, I'm essentially just following a very simple yet extremely effective uh, set of uh, principles endorsed by many of the top experts in investing in the world. Fourth, invest specifically in AI technology. If you want to go beyond the basic investment strategy, you definitely can be much more strategic with your investments in AI if you choose. Uh, you can invest specifically in AI solutions to improve your life and your business. Look for solutions to real world problems that AI is solving that are automatable and highly scalable. Uh, you can invest specifically in AI companies and tech startups. Look for companies with lots of data, a competitive advantage, or are disrupting an industry with AI. And you can invest in them in multiple ways by either working for them as an employee or as an angel investor or investing in uh, uh, funds or portfolios, which is the third thing. You can invest in AI tech funds, and these funds are actively managed portfolios of some of the most promising AI tech companies in the world. They have the potential to make lots of money, but they're more costly and more risky, so I don't necessarily recommend them um, or encourage, I encourage you to look into them yourself. Uh, essentially, just by investing in the entire economy as a whole, you're, for this, the casual investor, you're probably doing good enough. Fifth, invest early for compound growth. Exponential growth curves like the GDP uh, per capita capita in the United States year after year, start out slow and then explode quite rapidly. The sooner you invest in the AI economy, the better off you'll be exponentially. The next Googles, Amazons, and Microsofts, they're out there now or soon will be. You don't need to find them yourself. Um, you just need to be investing in the economy as a whole. And if you invest now, your long-term investments are going to reap this exponential uh, growth increase over time. So to recap our third and final recommendation, invest in an AI first economy. Uh, invest in yourself first, don't depend solely on your labor for income, invest in the economy as a whole, invest specifically in AI technology, and invest early for compound growth. All right, so let's wrap things up here real quick so we can get on to the magic. Um, first, I have several online courses that cover basics of artificial intelligence, data science, and machine learning. If any of you would like free access to any of these or all of the Photosight courses, just send me an email at my email address, which I'll give you on the last slide, and I'll send you a free 30-day access token so you can watch all of these courses for free. Second, be sure to check out my website. I have tons of free articles, videos, and courses. I also offer on-site training and consulting services to help businesses and teams get started with AI, data science, and machine learning. Third, I encourage you to engage with me and the AI community. Uh, please be sure to rate this presentation if there's a mechanism to do that. Uh, ask questions during the Q&A, send me comments via social media, and please uh, provide me with feedback on this presentation. I use your feedback to improve each and every presentation I give, and I take it very seriously. So uh, fourth, in summary, my five recommendations for preparing for the AI revolution are to educate yourself about AI, upgrade your career for AI, invest in an AI first economy, use AI responsibly and ethically, and adapt to what comes next or become obsolete. And for those last two recommendations, which we didn't have time to get to today, uh, just visit my website, go to the presentations page, you'll find artificial intelligence preparing your career for AI, and the video button there will take you right to the video to watch the last two recommendations. Finally, how does our story end? Technology is inherently amoral. It is neither intrinsically good nor evil. The same technology can be used to take mankind to the moon, or it can be used to propel warheads into cities. As a result, it's gonna be up to us as a society to choose whether we want to use AI to make the world a better place for everyone or to use it for our own power, profit, and control. The choice is ours to make. What will you choose? Thank you. It is it's so unusual these days to give a presentation and not hear applause at the end of it. It's almost, it's almost disheartening, but uh, when you can actually see people clapping on the screen, it, it's uh, kind of nice. It usually is like this, people are doing <laughs> online. Yeah. It's a very nice presentation. Uh, so we have some questions. Roland is asking, what is the time frame for this AI revolution? Um, it depends. So I think we're already beginning to see the beginnings of it right now. Since about the 
uh, mid 2000s is where it really started to ramp up. And with each of these technology revolutions, and not just the ones I discussed, but the other technology revolutions in between, um, they've accelerated in terms of their time frame. So if you think of the information technology revolution, I mean, that, that took several decades to happen. But like this revolution looks like it's happening in a much shorter time scale. So um, while I, I, don't, I don't feel comfortable making any predictions about when we'll reach artificial general intelligence, uh, many experts think we'll probably hit it sometime around 2050. So uh, I'm guessing when we hit that, the whole world has changed fundamentally in ways that, that we can't even predict at that point in time. So um, it, this is all within our lifetime. Uh, and for most of us, this is within our career. I assume that this will be the last thing I work on in my career. I started out as a software developer. I eventually moved into data science. I'm now doing AI. I don't expect there will be anything after AI for me to do. I'll, I'll most likely be retired at that point in time or automated out of a job. Uh, sorry, can someone is yeah, asking? You can go first. Uh, well, I just have a, a very silly question. So you mentioned you are a software developer, then data science, and then AI. So can I skip those first two and go to AI? <laughs> um, in some ways, yes. Like if you just want to leverage AI tool use, like as a video editor, there's a whole lot of tools that are coming out here in just the next few years. Like they've started coming out that allow you to fundamentally change your workflow by using AI, doing things that were not even possible just a few years ago. And that's, that's a profession just like a video editor. And all of these occupations are gonna see the same thing. A new sets of tools that will be coming out. Some people will learn how to use them and will like excel compared to their competition. And other people are just gonna sit by the sidelines and, and not learn how, how to leverage these tools. So if you just want to use AI tools, you can do this in pretty much any industry without needing uh, to be a software developer or a data scientist. However, if you want to um, a train AI, or sorry, build AI applications, you will have to have programming skills in order to leverage these pre-trained models. But but you won't need to know about data science or machine learning because someone else already took care of that. You're just using their pre-trained model and doing like a transfer learning on the top of it or using it as is. You just need to know how to program it just like any other function. Here's the input, here's the output, and then uh, be able to maintain it. Now, the people that are building these models from scratch, they essentially need to know uh, about artificial, or sorry, they need to know about data science and machine learning in order to train these models, do things uh, correctly and to you know maintain them in ways that uh, don't introduce errors or problems in the in the system and if you want to go to the next level you can do artificial intelligence research like essentially building the algorithms and and testing the theoretical limits of these uh, issues and for that you're pretty much going to need to be, have a PhD or at least a master's in computer science data science or a related field okay. there's something for everyone in in artificial intelligence okay. did you have a question Jesse yeah. Um, so um, for that picture, um, I think you showed it a little bit multiple times. It's like the robots that look like people. Oh, yes. Yep. Kind of what an android would look like. Androids think for themselves. They can look like people or animals or stuff like that. And also they, um, they can, ha they, so you know how um, robots don't have emotions? Yep. Well, ro well, androids can have emotions by actually seeing people have emotions. That is a very interesting insight. Um, in fact, most people don't know the difference between robots, androids, cyborgs, and the rest of them, but I'm glad you do. Cyborgs are actually part people and part robot or android. That is also, also correct. Maybe all three of them. Nobody knows. <laughs> Well, yeah, just uh, I think uh, just you can make uh, uh, about also a presentation about androids and Coincidentally, um, at Antarcticomp here this year, we had a speaker about Jesse's age that uh, gave his presentation on Bloxels, essentially um, programming video games for kids. Uh, we all, all the adults, loved it. In fact, a good chunk of the ship's crew and uh, like. Uh, passengers came in to watch this presentation as well and um, he's actually the youngest person to ever speak in Antarctica now as a result of this presentation wow. so if Jesse wants to give a talk I'm sure there's a venue for it somewhere so there are two what do you, more questions. Did I, when did I give a presentation oh no someone uh, on our, our Antarctic conference that was about your age 
But they, Jesse, I'm gonna I'm gonna mute you though, so everyone else can ask questions if that's all right. All right. Okay, Boris has a question. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. So I heard speculations that uh, like some of the software engineering will be automated as well by AI. Could you maybe speculate what kind of uh, software engineering would be obsolete, uh, if at all? Like so I don't know what specifically would be, but the stuff that we just saw coming out of Microsoft build here this last week um, and, and stuff we saw, you know, just a, a year ago um, with uh, uh, what was it called deep code nine and some other tools that are essentially trying to automate uh, coding. They, they look like they're doing a relatively good job of using existing code bases, essentially using GitHub as a massive data source for uh, how to code a solution to very specific problems. Um, I think that could be beneficial to augment a, um, like a programmer's skills to essentially in the same way we were using templates for code uh, years ago. Uh, but I don't think that specifically is going to automate away the software developer. There's certain things that we're doing though uh, with program synthesis that could eventually lead to uh, complete automation of programming uh, functions and stuff. But my, my guess is a lot of that's going to be in small domains. So for example, if you're creating a regular expression, you may use a, a, an automated tool to synthetically generate the regular expression from a set of inputs in what you want the outputs to look like. We currently have that technology or something similar to that, uh, even in Microsoft Excel and Power BI. Um, they can essentially generate data or, or data transformations by taking inputs and expected outputs, and it figures it out. It's actually pretty good at doing it too, from what I've seen and what I've used or, and how I've used it. Um, so I think we'll automate some of those tasks, but I don't think general purpose software development is going away anytime in the near future. I think there's, there's going to be a need for that for quite a long time. But hopefully as software developers, we become more productive with the tools that we use, which may uh, eventually lead to a decrease in the need for um, you know, programmers because each programmer is 10 times more effective with the automated tools that we have access to. But it's a really interesting question and I'm very uh, interested to see how things turn out in the near future. Uh, I did see that uh, talk that you was talking about with Microsoft. Oh yeah, yeah, from Build. Yeah, yeah, yeah very uh, impressive. They, they actually, what their plan is first uh, is actually having care programming with uh, AI instead of a colleague. So you're, and it's it was like more their model more or less was uh, what you call. Uh, uh, Looking in the future, what is called? <laughs> uh, gotcha. It's like speculating. You know, yeah, I. Yeah, uh, like finding out what your next move is before mm -hmm. you know it and see what possibilities you have. Or I, 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 I definitely see that as a potential uh, tool going forward. In fact, I've speculated about it uh, several times that pair programming may disappear in the sense that you're pairing with another human and it may eventually become that you're pairing with an AI that's essentially making recommendations based on best practices from you know, every expert in the world. When I think about just using the tool ReSharper uh, as a C-sharp developer you know, several years ago, um, how much I learned just by having it make suggestions to me about, hey, maybe you should try this instead. And I'd be like, that's a terrible suggestion. And then I would try it and you know, I'd be like, oh my God, yeah, it is actually more readable or the code functions better by doing it that way. And it, it completely and fundamentally changed my coding style to incorporate these best practices that I would not have listened to if another human down the road had just suggested it. And it was just a machine essentially making recommendations based on what it was seeing me do. And that was 10 years ago. So the stuff we have now and the stuff another 10 years from now will likely be, you know, like pairing with, you know, the, the best, like pairing with uncle Bob to learn how to uh, write clean code or do clean architecture. So be pretty cool. So we have question, another question from Odrus. Maybe you could expand a little bit what is the difference between uh, these fields, data science and machine learning? So there's quite a bit of overlap between data science and machine learning. And so data science is essentially founded in statistics and is about using data in order to make better decisions. Whereas machine learning is more founded in the computer science side of things and it's more about using data in order to teach a computer 
a function that can then be used to make predictions in the future. So in one case, you're essentially having humans make better decisions, and the other case, you're having machines make better decisions, and where they intersect in the middle is essentially with these, these models. So in statistics, you can have either statistics, or sorry, in uh, data science, you can either have statistical models or machine learning models, and in the machine learning world, you're working specifically with machine learning, but not uh, statistical models like uh, causal models or um, more uh, statistically rigorous things. So there's definitely a lot of overlap, but they are different in terms of their disciplines and their backgrounds. And in some cases, the language that they use for the exact same thing. Paul is asking about, is there already a tool that has AI model from GitHub that works as intelligence? Um, in terms of uh, synthesizing code? Paul is... Um, I think so there is I, already I, a, a tool uh, that has the model trained from GitHub that basically works as IntelliSense for Visual Studio, I think. Yeah, you might be thinking of DeepTab9. Um, that came out, I think it was about a year ago as a predecessor. And I, I can't remember if that was built on GPT-2 or what model it was built on. The new one that Microsoft just demoed, as, if I'm not mistaken, is built on their Turing uh, NLG model. So GPT-2 um, was like last year's technology that had 1.2 billion parameters and could essentially synthesize uh, language, like generate language as output. It could summarize articles. It could create you know, fake news at an unprecedented scale. And it could also um, do a bunch of other uh, you know, text or language related features. So if you fed it you know, C-sharp code rather than English code, it could essentially you know, uh, work like IntelliSense, but predict entire blocks of code. Now, the um, Microsoft's um, uh, Turing NLG model, so that was 1.5 billion parameters. This is 17 billion parameters, so significantly more complex. They look at it as essentially upgrading our knowledge of a language from essentially like a kindergartner's knowledge of a language to like a high schooler's knowledge of a language. So the ability to um, take English and essentially synthesize uh, full articles, uh, summaries of articles, uh, you know, sentences, whatever you want to do is significantly more advanced uh, just in this year than it was last year. So the tools that will allow us to actually, you know, really work well with um, a synthetic code or synthesized code, uh, we just got there, I think, probably this year. The stuff before that is more like an IntelliSense on steroids. This is essentially synthesizing entire, you know, code for uh, a whole function.